for us, the whole idea of regeneration really is, ends with the, or, or is fully inclusive of the land, but it starts with who owns, who controls, and who gets to make the decisions about what happens on the land. That's where regeneration starts. And that's what we lost. We lost the ownership, control, and governance of the system, and that's why we are now being really everything, almost we, you turn around and everything is fake. There is very few things that are real, and I'm so happy to be here with the real people, with the real food, with the real, you know, what I say, insurgents in this intellectual battle against the fake stuff that is invaded us and is starting to colonize all the way to our mind. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. Together we are a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock that is raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Rehinaldo Haslett Moroquin of Tree Range Farms in Minnesota. Rehi focuses on the climate beneficial practices of silvopasture by running chickens under hazelnut and maple trees but Rehi's vision goes far beyond poultry farming. He recognizes that each community and its broader region needs a robust food system to support the kind of real organic and real regenerative success stories that we are looking for. Here he is at our Saving Real Organic conference at Churchtown Dairy last October. I'm sure you'll find him to be a very inspiring speaker. Our next speaker is Reginaldo Haslet Marroquin, and he's going to talk to us about tree range farms. So listen carefully there, there's a T, tree range farms. And it's actually a cooperative of farmers that are grazing chickens underneath trees. Uh, Paul Hawken is one of the advisors uh, to the Real Organic Project, and when he wrote Drawdown, he said silvopasture, which is uh, running animals underneath trees is, is, I think it was number four. It was in the top 10 of things that we must do in, in order to fix the climate crisis. So, Ray? Buenos dias. And thank you, Francis, for raising that energy. It's really cool. I'll be um, representing Tree Range Farms, which is the market go-to-market strategy of an ecosystem of businesses where we have literally built a supply chain from grain, from aggregation of grain to production of poultry, to the processing of poultry, to the branding, distribution, and everything. For, for us, the whole idea of regeneration really is, ends with the, or, or is fully inclusive of the land, but it starts with who owns, who controls, and who gets to make the decisions about what happens on the land. That's where regeneration starts. And that's what we lost. We lost the ownership, control, and governance of the system, and that's why we are now being really everything, almost we, you turn around and everything is fake. There is very few things that are real, and I'm so happy to be here with the real people, with the real food, with the real, you know, what I say, insurgents in this intellectual battle against the fake stuff that is invaded us and is starting to colonize all the way to our minds. So that's why I'm here. That's why I am grateful to be here as well because you are the real people and that really you know means a lot to me I'm a Guatemalan I was four years old when the war started the civil war I was I had been here four years before it ended just to give you an idea of the kind of um, not you know this whole thing about fighting systems I really don't like that the fighting thing is I'd rather be working on building the stuff we want and coming together like this and not giving an inch. That really is how we're gonna get there. And so, so we need a real regenerative movement, we need a real organic movement, we need a real food movement, like a real dairy barn, you know, national movement. I mean, we need everything real again. Let's make America real again. <laughs> So, it's critical to understand that regenerative agriculture, for a lot of us, is really 
it started by understanding our ancestral roots. My great-grandfather and my great-grandmother were talking about regenerating the landscape where we farmed. They, they learned that from many generations before that, all of the, uh, all of the elders that I have been lucky to be educated by, you know, different from the schools which domesticate you, our elders educated us. And so that, that's another play of words that we got to get straight. And so, and I am learning so much about words from, uh, because she's like, you are the word master. I really like that. <laughs> Nobody gets through uh, with the wrong word. That's good. Um, so anyway, but regenerative, regenerative to us is really a way of thinking. It's a way of being, of relating, of working, of knowing, and a way of relating especially to the living systems of the planet. That's what regenerative is about. We kind of tend to reduce things into these spaces so we can manipulate them, and that's what we call mental colonization, and we shouldn't do that. So let's keep that in mind as we think about what we're doing here, how we are taking this, this issue of collective ownership and control, governance, and all those whole systems thinking as the centerpiece of how we build real regenerative, um, the, the next real regenerative movement uh, alongside the real organic and all these other things that we have to do, right? So for us, it's critical to understand this. The whole thing of farming has very little to do with production of anything. We are simply stewards of processes of transformation of energy, which through the biophysics and the chemistry of the planet that evolved over billions of years, energy goes from non-edible to us to edible to us, whether it's milk, whether it's eggs, whether it's a lettuce, it was first CO2 and hydrogen, hydrogen and all of that, and through those processes, it became what we harvest. But we are harvesting what? Energy, not a product. Product is the, the word of the extractive colonizing system that seeks to maximize whatever comes out of the land. We don't do that in regenerative thinking. We harvest the energy, and because of that, we have to optimize where that energy is transformed. There's three places on the planet where that is happening. Photosynthesis, the most important part, because that's where it all begins. The participation of animals, because animals are the most effective transformers of the outputs of photosynthesis. You take a hay bale and you put it out there in a compost pile, and it'll take a year before it's soil. You take that, comp that bale and put it into a cow, and 48 hours later, it's being pooped and peed, and then another 48 hours later, it's starting to become nutrients for everything that wants to do photosynthesis again, and that's how brilliant the process and magnificent the design is, and that is what allows for the energy flows to be l more than the energy that we harvest, and that is what we call the regenerative factor, is energy. It's not no-till, it's, it's not agricultural practices, it's a factor that is scientifically verifiable. And so that's how the animals at the end of the day, you know, and the soil you know, on the bottom close that loop, three of the places where energy is transformed on a planetary basis. So for us, it was important to take the chicken, it's a long story, but just to be, you know, uh, clear, I, I, I really speak for the chickens when I say that they are not only a jungle fowl, but also look from their perspective, the world looks very different if you actually start to think real. Real regenerative means looking at the world from the perspective of the organisms you are working and relating and knowing with. So a lettuce sees the world one way, a cow does it a different way, a chicken does it in a different way, that's all we did try to get as indigenously connected intellectually with what the chicken sees, and that's where our design, all the agronomics come from. So in this context, the chicken is part of these three spaces where energy is being transformed. The chicken is the livestock that we chose to make a point about how we can do real regenerative. And so as we, can you check, is there three icons in the screen or is there four? Three, okay, I know which screen is playing now. <laughs> so, 
So we, we came into this space to optimize those biophysics and chemistry. And you know, you, you all know very well that those, those factors are, are governed by the laws of thermodynamics that establishes that energy can only be transformed, it cannot be created or destroyed. And so that's all we are doing. It's the same energy that was here on the planet many billions of years ago, and hopefully we don't ship too much more into space so we can keep some of it. Um, so we see the chicken in the middle of that, where we harvest some of the first energy we harvest is from the perennial crops that, as a jungle fowl, we have to put it under this environment where it evolved over millions of years. And so as we do that, those perennial crops are, are central to that environment uh, for, for the poultry to thrive. And I could give you books of how this has resulted in this optimal conditions, not only for the health of the animal, but for the efficiency of the energy transformation process and all of that. So we get to harvest energy over and over as we put this, this system to work. Uh, the first, again, is the fruits and, veg and, and, and nuts, mostly, that we are able to harvest out of the upper level of the poultry environment. On the ground, we're sprouting grains at a large scale so that we can start moving away from feed and all of those other inputs that are needed. The, what is not edible to us immediately is edible to trillions of other creatures, like the manure and the feathers and giblets and all of that, which then we move that energy. We are now moving that into the fields where the grain is being grown. It's literally manure spreading, okay? I'm just making it a little bit fancy so that you guys... Uh, uh, all, some of that energy is going into vegetable production. We have tested 250 different vegetable varieties. One of the things you may want to know is that poultry manure has all of the 13 basic elements that every plant needs to, to, to thrive, to be successful as a, an expression of its own genetics. And so this is really fascinating because now we can start bringing ancestral medicines and all of that, and it's all because of the chicken. This is what, you know, I, I figured that we are, the, we are the, the other side of the, you know, Francis with the cows, us with the chickens, and like we start putting that together and we can have a real regenerative movement when we get all of the livestock sectors together and start taking over the USDA and all those other departments that are actually, you know. I mean, they were taking over already, so why couldn't we take them over again? Like, it's like why not, right? And I love this, and, and you know, the, the, the Real Organic Standards Board, I mean, like, dang, that was brilliant. Um, and, and we need to make that now the, the, the Real Standards Board, you know what I mean, rather than the one we have. Um, so that gives you an idea of how we structure this, this idea of real regenerative. Again, it's about the mindset, it's about how we decolonize our minds so that we can see the other 95% of the potential of the landscape that we don't see through the colonizing lens of extraction and expropriation and all of those urges that have actually led us to where we are. In this case, you take the poultry, it comes a day old, they stay in the barns for in the barn for four weeks because they are too small to be ranging. After four weeks, you know, in that time we have been preparing the landscape outside. Uh, in this case, is literally dozens of different native species and forages and all of that. Grain that has been spread right before the, the, the chickens are going to start ranging and then continuing to do that. And when there is no canopy yet, we can build that canopy with sunflowers, corn. In my case, edible corn from which we make tortillas and it's ancestral. I mean, all of this is part of that process. We don't move the buildings because honestly, we don't have to. All of the energy, and now there's three years later of scientific verification of that energy flow, we know that. And then 15, 17 years later, after the first unit was built, everything is flourishing in there. There is no excess nutrients. There is no bare ground. It's all covered. And uh, by the way, the problem is that if we don't have chickens there, it just takes over. It's like so productive now. And so... You know, chickens are happy, we are happy. There is very little labor because chickens are really good laborers themselves. And that makes us, if you want to call it from a colonizer perspective, efficient, right? <laughs> but not only that, we took that and then said, okay, how many units can we put on a, on a farm so that we can actually balance out the output of manure with the landscape we have available? And then thinking not only of the farm, but if a farmer, for example, comes in like in my condition with no land, and I only have access to a few acres, and I don't have land to put the manure into, 
because the manure in the barns is being collected and then, and then moved outside of the, of the chicken areas. Uh, then we built, that's why we built systems of farms instead of single farms. And so now coordinated, we always have more landscape than we have manure for. And that we're going to keep that ratio so that we always keep that balance of energy flows, not on a farm level necessarily, but thinking on the system level. Why? Because regeneration doesn't happen on a farm or because of a product. Regeneration is an ecosystem function. Let's keep that in mind. It's an ecosystem function, not a farm level function. And the farm contributes to it, yes, and we, but we got to coordinate uh, across regions in order to achieve regenerative outcomes. And that's a big difference between the fake stuff, regenerative, you know, the use of the regenerative word out there for the purpose of profit versus the real thing. So I will keep introducing you to the chickens. At four weeks, they start being trained to be outdoors. Those are hazelnuts, by the way, native to two-thirds of the continental US. Just to give you an idea of the magnificent capacity of this country to do real regenerative poultry. OK, now, you see the cl how close those, those trees are to the barn? And they are lush, and they produce two and a half times more nuts than the, the trees outside of that fence, to give an idea of this, this balance that we are able to achieve. Now, this is the same flock. This is my wife, Amy. And this is the no morning chores. You put the feet out, you go open the door. And these are the same birds. Uh, slow growth, 70, 70, days, 70 days later. They are about to have their one bad day. Still running and jumping and taking leaps like they did on the first day. It's just. Um, OK, so then organic matter, right? So we take all of this material, we mix it at a, at a, so that we can get that 40 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. And now we have this larger scale mixing of slow release um, fertilizers that we can bring into this space where there is no chickens. We don't want chickens running around everywhere. So we got this structured really professionally so that we can build you know, curriculum and processes and verifiable systems, you know, scientific processes to monitor what's going on there and all of that. Scientifically verifiable, economically viable, socially compatible with us because we, you know, it's socially compatible with a farmer with 1.5 acres, that's the unit of production. It's, it's, it's just, you hit all of the engines. That is what regenerative is about. Getting everything, not just one thing, so you can make a buck out there by calling something regenerative. For us, the hazelnuts are central because hazelnuts are native to this ecology. They, they produce the same amount of biomass as soybeans per acre, need no tilling, need nothing, except the chickens, of course. But, it's also more nutritious. It's got um, protein levels similar or above soybeans, for example. It's actually a perfect substitute for soybeans in the Midwest because it's not only native, but it's, in, it's symbiotic to so many other species that can be supported. We can literally restore the water systems. In fact, our hazelnuts are now clogging all of the drain tile that was on the farm where I, where, that I bought. I don't even need to rip it because the hazelnuts will clog the heck out of them, and then our water gets to stay on the farm. Well, in the bottom, I did dig a whole bunch of pools so that the drain tile that is draining that water actually still stays on the farm, right? So anyway, just to give you an idea of the kind of work that we have been doing on this, all the biomass is then turned around, mixed with the manure, so we can grow, again, Almost every vegetable we have tried, including our garlic, our heritage beans from Guatemala, heritage corn, and so on, um, with the only input being wood chips, organic matter, poultry manure. And as we scale this, we can also, we're also scaling that whole sector, uh, including pollinators. But here's something. This is the land I bought. This is where it is. This is what I started, you know, put a pasture right away because that puts, you know, cover. Then we planted, then we restored the waterways. 
Then we planted 8,200 hazelnuts. The idea is the whole farm, the whole 65 acres will look like this. Chicken heaven is what I call it. So this, as we do this, the businesses around it also start to evolve from the chicken and the egg. Now, no longer talking about a farm, but regions of farms. We can aggregate that production for the poultry processing facility, for example. So we went ahead and bought a meatpacking facility out of Stacyville, Iowa, and now we're deploying more farms around the system. We are also looking for partners uh, in the native communities with larger waterways so we can take the byproducts from the plant, that energy, move it into the fish population because cross-species feeding is actually good in nature, right? And so then we, you take those out products, those outputs from those different places, you mix them up with the vegetable leftovers and you have feed that can go back to the chickens and so on, feed supplements and value added products, transportation, warehousing, the technical assistance that we just launched a new fund to capitalize the system and on and on it goes. And now what you have is a business ecosystem center on poultry. That's what we call real regenerative. It's not about no till or any of that stuff, right? So now we are talking about regions. Now we are talking about taking over the space that we gave up. That's where we are coming from. And so our next big step is ensuring that we start talking about governance. And this is why I love this whole, you know, real regenerative standards board, because that, to me, represents a governing body that is actually real. And so we need governing bodies like that in every sector. We are building now the Regenerative Poultry Council of America, and the idea would be that then representatives from there could end up being that, you know, these regions feed into the national board so we can end up, hopefully, eventually, with a real regenerative organic Council of America and at that point, we truly take over the USDA. That's my dream for governance. And it's so doable, more doable than anybody thought was to, one, meet the massive Guatemalan army, survive it, and actually not lose to them. At the peak of our insurgency, there were only 10,000 effective rebels and over 980,000 soldiers trying to kill us. And yet, they couldn't win. And this is the message I wanted to leave you with. We are engaged not in a real organic or a real regenerative. We are engaged in an intellectual insurgency. That is the real thing we're in. And we, these are the tools we'll use to organize and to win. That's what I'm here for. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. Our movement is growing because you're subscribing and sharing these podcasts with your friends. So keep it up and leave us a rating and a review as well. You can find a video version of this interview on our newly designed website, realorganicproject.org, or on our YouTube channel. And you can join us every Tuesday for a new episode featuring voices from the organic movement. So we'll see you next time.